Wow, what a crowd. Uh, this is uh, going to be an interesting debate, I think, uh, because we all have very different perspectives on this complicated problem. Personally, I think this debate is silly because it's obvious that you need theory and data, and you're not going to get anywhere just collecting a bunch of data and not having an explanation for that data. The whole point of science is to come up with an explanation for data that accurately predicts what happens in the real world. On the other hand, I really think it's ridiculous to think we're going to get there just with theory. After all, the brain has 90 billion neurons, and thinking really hard about the brain is probably not going to get us to a solution that accounts for what those 93, 90 billion neurons do. The brain is a non-dynamical system. It's a complicated computer of a form that doesn't exist anywhere else on Earth, and, and we have really just the barest understanding of how it works. So we're going to need to combine theory and data. But of course, the, at any given point in time, we're going to be more limited by one of these things, either theory or data. And the question for today is, which of these is limiting us more right now? And if we were honest with ourselves, we would say if we really want to make progress in neuroscience, we would just build a better tool for measuring the brain. Because the history of science shows us that the fastest way to make progress in science is either to build a new tool to measure something no one could measure before, or to take an old tool and apply it to some completely new problem where it's never been applied before. And in, as you know, in the last 20 years, the two great tools that have been developed in neuroscience that have really changed our conception of everything are optogenetics and uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging and other forms of MRI. The problem for non-invasive human cognitive neuroscience is that it's pretty difficult to come up with a new tool that will actually provide useful data from the human brain because uh, the human skull is pretty thick and it does not like to give up its secrets. So in the absence of any brilliant insights from any of you about how to build a new tool that will measure things from the human brain that we can't measure now, uh, we're stuck with trying to find more efficient ways to uh, collect data using our existing tools and to process that data and use it to test and develop new theories. And we know that uh, in the field of biology and psychology and cognitive neuroscience that the methods that we've been using to do our experiments and develop our theories have some problems. Uh, there's a long, well not a long standing, a recent acknowledgement of a very bad problem with uh, p-hacking and statistical significance errors and failures to replicate that swamps all of biology and psychology. It's not just a cognitive neuroscience problem, it's not just an MRI problem, it's everywhere in biology and psychology. It's in every field of science that mistakes point null significance testing for predictive modeling. Those are not the same thing at all, and finding a significant test does not tell you anything about the predictive power of your model. And uh, this category error causes a lot of heartache because it means that people uh, get stuck in local minima and uh, publish unreplicable results. We know that this problem affects MRI to some extent. We're not exactly sure how much, but uh, at least some fraction of MRI uh, studies uh, are going to be replicated. They're going to have problems with p-values. Uh, we know that we should be thinking beyond statistical significance and be thinking about prediction, trying to make elegant, beautiful, explanatory models that predict, uh, but we don't really have any systematic ways to do that that are common across the field. So uh, I think if we wanted to make progress on this issue of uh, advancing cognitive neuroscience in the face of difficult theory and never enough data, uh, the real issue that we can make progress on right away is to try to improve our experimental paradigms. Now, it's easy to make a demonstration that our current experimental paradigms are weak. This is uh, data from a really simple experiment. Uh, there are four different conditions here. In the upper left condition, people listen to single words in the magnet. This is a classic uh, language experiment that people do day in and day out in the MRI uh, in many, many published studies. And there are three other conditions here. I'll just have you focus on the bottom right where people are listening to narratives. What is being plotted on these cortical maps is the signal to noise ratio, the amount of potentially recoverable data in these maps. And you can see that there's a lot more data that can be recovered in the narrative condition than in the single word condition. This is for a variety of reasons. People in single word experiments get bored. They don't pay attention. Attention has a huge influence on signal to noise in MRI. The single word experiment is not natural. The narrative experiment is natural. People's brains naturally uh, resonate and operate better under naturalistic conditions. 
Um, there are a lot of reasons that these conditions are different. My only point is that the signal to noise, the available information that can be exploited in a model, is much higher in the narrative condition than the single word condition. Of course, the narrative condition has problems. The single word condition can be a component of an elegant, beautiful, counterbalanced experiment with fairly simple uh, operational definitions of variables and a simple data analysis procedure, and a narrative experiment is going to involve complicated correlated variables that are going to have to be decomposed and modeled and variance partitioned appropriately in the data analysis procedure. So by switching to a method that gives us more signal to noise, meaning more potentially explainable information under natural conditions, the cost is that it increases the burden on the experimentalist to create a good model. Nevertheless, people have been working on how to model uh, naturalistic experiments for over 30 years now, first in neurophysiology and uh, more recently in the last 10 years in MRI, and we know a lot about how to build these models. Uh, these are data you've probably all seen because I think probably almost everybody in this room has played with this brain viewer at this point. Uh, this is data from a simple narrative experiment where people are being asked to listen to stories in the magnet. And then we uh, map in each individual brain the semantic selectivity of each individual voxel. So essentially this is a 2,000 dimensional semantic vector that is the model for each individual voxel. And we can click on individual voxels to discover their expected semantic selectivity. Uh, and there are a lot of these kinds of experiments that can, you can do. Uh, there are fairly straightforward from a conceptual point of view, but implementing them uh, is a giant pain in the rear end, I confess. Uh, however, you can take these data and save a lot of time in the data acquisition phase because these experiments are fairly easy to do. They're natural for the subjects. You need fewer subjects because you're getting a result in each individual subject, so you're replicating the result within the experiment rather than simply doing things at the group level and you can fit multiple models. So here's an example using these, uh, this isn't using uh, narrative data, this is using movies with sound, and we're fitting a motion energy model, a semantic model, a thematic roles model, uh, a spectrogram model, and a syntax and semantics model. Simultaneously, in individual subjects, this uses uh, fairly sophisticated variance partitioning and a banded ridge regression procedure that allows us to optimize the signal to noise while fitting all of these models simultaneously. And you can see that this uh, produces pretty rich data set, pretty rich cognitive maps or uh, uh, functional maps. Uh, these methods can go a bit beyond just fitting a lot of models, which is essentially a multiple hypothesis testing kind of procedure, they can actually reveal fundamental new properties of the brain that uh, we had not expected before. So these data are uh, a combination of data acquired in, a in a, an experiment where people are watching movies and an experiment where people are listening to the stories. Uh, on the top, on this uh, cortical flat map, you see that there's a small band of color. Everything in the middle of the screen is the visual cortex. These are the parts of the brain that respond to movies and they do not uh, respond to stories. And uh, in front of that line, both to the left and the right of the screen, are the parts of the brain that respond to stories and they don't respond to movies. So this is the anterior border of the occipital cortex. Now you can take each individual voxel in the brain and you can fit a semantic model to that voxel and you can look at the correspondence of semantics in vision and narrative stories. And you see that there's a very close correspondence along this band such that a voxel that's in occipital cortex and is selective for one semantic category like places will be immediately posterior to a voxel, uh, an anterior voxel that only responds to stories but is selective for the same semantic category. So this is part of a larger semantic network that is distributed across the brain uh, that integrates information from various sensory modalities and various types to uh, confer meaning in the world. And I, this is a, a beautiful, elegant kind of solution that the brain hit on, but I don't know of anybody who's ever thought about this before or predicted this. This was purely a data-driven observation. Now, I understand that a lot of people don't want to deal with complicated experiments. They are, after all, a, a pain in the rear end. So uh, we're building uh, a tool that's going to allow you to interrogate naturalistic data as if you were doing a classical contrast experiment. So in this particular case, this is a, a, a website you can go to called boldpredictions.gallantlab.org. Uh, 
And uh, you can type in two classes of words. For example, I think here we're doing sight words versus sound words. And it will give you a contrast map uh, in MNI coordinates. It will, all give you the, it will also give you the contrast map for the individual subjects in this experiment. And of course, this is an in silico experiment. It's not an experiment we actually did. It's an experiment. Uh, it's a virtual experiment that shows you the results we would have expected to have gotten if we had done the reduced experiment. And now you could ask, well, are these maps you're getting valuable? Can I just avoid doing a real experiment now? So you can test this by actually doing a second experiment to verify that this worked. So uh, on the top here is the semantic map obtained from one of my typical subjects, which in this case is one of my graduate students. And uh, this is a semantic map uh, obtained while this person was listening to stories. Uh, we ran a contrast for uh, visual words, which are shown in green on the upper map, and social words, which are shown in red. And on the bottom left is a contrast from the bold predictions viewer between uh, visual words and semantic words. Visual words are shown in blue, and semantic words are shown in red. Excuse me, social words are shown in red. So you can see that uh, these are the results we would have expected to have gotten if we had done an experiment contrasting uh, visual words with social words. Now we had another experiment that we had run where uh, we had two conditions. One was where we asked people to do visual imagery, and the other was where we asked them questions about their family. And the contrast between those two conditions is shown on the lower right. In this case, the visual words are in green, and the social words are in red. And you can see that the map on the lower left and the map on the lower right look almost identical, even though these are from completely different experiments. But what they have in common is the underlying semantic representation, the feature space, the cortical maps. So you can recover a lot of data from these experiments. You can recover way more data per unit money time in these data-driven naturalistic experiments than you can ever do in a contrast experiment. And I'm all about optimizing data per unit money time. Because I, I don't know about you, but I have finite money and time to work with. And I like to get as much mutual information between my stimulus and my task conditions and my brain responses as I can during that time. So I think that the fastest way to make progress in cognitive neuroscience is to use the vestibule technology to collect large, information-rich data sets uh, that span the domain of interest, and then to model those data using the most powerful computational and technical tools available. Thanks for your time.